Give it up. <clears throat> no, thanks so much. It's uh, hard to come in after an act like that, uh, but we have some really terrific panelists here with us. Arya Burkhoff, founder and chairman of, and CEO of Lion Tree, is also well known as media's hottest deal maker. So uh, we have an M&A expert right down there. Back in the days of media deal making. Back, right? in, back in the days of media <laughs> investing. All right. Uh, we can talk about that. Uh, and Michal Katz, uh, managing director, head of investment, corporate banking at Mizuho Americas, uh, is perennially recognized as one of the most powerful women in finance, which we know means she's one of the most powerful people in finance. So thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, Neil, I'll, I'll start with you because you joined us in November of last year, the first uh, iconoclast. And I think it's fair to sum that up as uh, the general mood was pretty much doom and gloom. Has that changed in six months? Uh, what's, what's your take on that? So despite this being Merger Monday with a $10.5 billion transaction by uh, NASDAQ acquiring a fintech company and Novartis acquiring a, another deal for $3.5 billion, um, we stand five months into 2023, uh, $1.1 1 .1 of deal volume is 40% off 22. And as you recall, 2022 ended off being approximately 40% off 2021, which was a record uh, M&A volume across the street. And I would say a couple of observations uh, between 22 and 23, where we are today, is that in 2022, both um, financial sponsor and corporate activity were down pretty evenly. Uh, this year, it seems that private equity has been pretty much on the sidelines with that deal volume down 60 plus percent versus corporate volume being down 20 percent. Mm. And the other um, observation I would make is that when you take a look at the size of deals, just given some of the dynamics, which I'll talk about in a moment, is that um, uh, transactions that are 10 billion plus are down significantly more than the sweet spot of the one to $10 billion. So why is that? When you think about what is really the recipe for M&A deal making, you need to have a level of certainty, you need to have confidence. And both 2022 and 2023 are still very much characterized by what I would say is a, a heightened degree of uncertainty and, and lack of confidence. When you think about what does confidence mean, whether it be uh, conviction about an industrial logic for a transaction, conviction about your own performance or the performance of the target, uh, an ability to get financing done in the market, um, or an ability to, or, uh, to get to, uh, to regulatory approval and mm -hmm. have kind of this certainty on closure. And a lot of it has been lacking and continued to lack in 2023. Um, if you want to talk about the outlook, I do think that um, looking into the end of this year, perhaps going to 2024, I do think that there are definitely green shoots out there. Uh, M&A dialogue continues. Uh, pipelines are robust. Uh, companies do want to position themselves um, for getting to on the other side of things and partake in some of the activity that has been talked about in prior panels, uh, whether it be in the energy transition or AI and what have you. But it has been uh, pretty subdued uh, for, this, uh, for the start of this year. Arya, are you same sort of feeling or different? Yeah. I mean, Michal painted the, the picture very well, I think. Um, it's hard, obviously, when you're talking about generalities overall. I mean, when you dig deeper into any industry, uh, there are uh, exceptions and there are reasons to do deals or create partnerships, uh, particularly when there's pressure. Uh, I also think overall the economy has held up better than most people have expected, partially because we haven't really gone into any kind of crash mode. Uh, but we've had more of an asynchronous type of slowdown where different industries slow down at different times. So we had supply chain a few years ago. Last year was more technology driven. Now we have a banking uh, crisis, so to speak. Uh, but other industries are coming out of it, like luxury and the consumer in certain areas are very strong. Europe has outperformed people's expectations. Um, obviously, AI is uh, a growth area. Forms of biotech and healthcare are structurally very sound. Media, an area we focus on, has experienced a lot of pressure. Um, and, um, and that pressure sometimes creates uh, the necessity of talking to each other and getting outside of your own organic 
construct to do deals. Sometimes those are partnerships. Sometimes those are areas of alignment, but you can't do all things yourself. Our theme has been growing down this year. So not all growth is up and to the right. Finding your competitive essence, finding your competitive advantage, realizing what it is, and then making sure that you restructure your business and your cost structure around it, and then find other partners that can get you to where you need to go, not all organically, not all through deals. Um, you start to see that actually even uh, this last week in sports when um, you know, Messi came to uh, the yeah. Miami uh, uh, club and uh, went away from obviously some of the uh, capital coming out of uh, the Gulf. And, uh, but it wasn't just that he chose Miami, it was that there was an aligned structure with the sponsorship model of Adidas and the media streaming deal that Apple did with MLS. And that actually creates uh, an interesting form of a partnership where a, a player now sells jerseys. I think it's like $150 per jersey. And they sold 2 million jerseys right off the bat. They've sold out. It's $300 million yeah. right off the bat of sales. The team uh, gets 15% uh, of that cut, which is $45 million which doubled the revenue of the Inter-Miami club uh, that they didn't have before. And that doesn't even include the streaming revenue or the sponsorship or actually the growth in other players in the sport. So that's how you actually lift up a whole sport with an aligned model out of necessity where before you didn't have Messi anywhere near MLS or Inter-Miami or Apple a year ago or Adidas. So that's where you start to see from the bottom creating new models by working together. Aria, I'm, I'm getting the impression you like sports analogies in sports because I, I was reading your annual report last year, uh, your letter, uh, where you said the best uh, offense is a good defense. And how would each of you characterize your current position? Is it offensive or is it defensive? It's definitely defensive uh, from my perspective. Um, but the key thing about investing or understanding markets is recognizing the shift. So uh, right now it's defensive, um, but the shift is going to come where you grow down and then grow up again, so mm. to speak. And, uh, and if you miss the shift, like if you miss the shift in AI or tech, you could fall behind very fast and it doesn't feel so, so good. So I think it's staying active, staying creative, staying in conversations with clients and with the constituents, with investors, with partners, um, and making sure that the capital is obviously plentiful I think that while we don't yet know where interest rates fall out, we do have a much better sense today than we did six months ago, and that's investable again. And then we also know where oil is kind of you know, shaking out, you know, 70, $75 per barrel. These are kind of metrics that you can actually play around. So I'm defensive, but there's a shift that will come, I think, you know, later in the year. Yep. Offense, defense. Well, speaking of that shift that may come, despite M&A being uh, down 40% for the second uh, year in a row, and hopefully the year will finish off a little bit better, um, we at Mizuho, and I can't talk too much about it, but decided to lean in. And uh, last month we uh, made an announcement that we are acquiring an M&A and restructuring boutique Greenhill. M&A um, has consistently been 40% of the investment banking fee pool. So to me, that's trying to position ourselves for when the markets do come back on the other side of it and, um, and, and being ready to take advantage of the opportunity. And I'll also say that, you know, uh, Arya uh, alluded to before about sector dependent and companies across sectors. If you are a strong, well-capitalized company with access to the capital markets, this is your opportunity to act. And mm -hmm. we have seen that with some mega deals uh, in the healthcare space, whether it was last year was the Amgen announcement of Horizon Therapeutics. Uh, Pfizer announced its acquisition of, of CGen. Um, and then I talked about the one earlier this morning. So these companies, when they went into the capital markets with mega bond financings, they were able to get the deals done very well received and they were oversubscribed. So I do think it does depend on who you are. Um, I'll also say that, um, you know, we are seeing just talking about financing somewhat. I mean, the leverage finance market has been quite challenging and uh, we are seeing some th signs that it's thawing and banks that have had underwriting positions of our last year are working through those. Um, you know, I was thinking about in, uh, in thinking about this panel and the conversation we had uh, in November about how deals were getting done, and that was an incredibly challenging um, period. 
uh, there was a transaction that was done by uh, Blackstone acquiring a climate technology out of uh, Emerson. It was a majority buyout. And back then, um, they had resorted to this kind of cocktail of solutions, whether it was a seller's note, direct lenders, uh, banks um, had underwritten a part of the debt. Um, and just this past month, uh, Blackstone went back into the market and repackaged or refinanced the original package with an institutional financing, both the term loan B as well as secured notes. So no, not all things are great. It's going to take a while to work itself through. But again, right sector, right companies, has to be the right structure and the right pricing. So let, let's talk sectors for a moment, because uh, the next panel is about AI, and everything's AI right now. So tech, uh, tech's, uh, FinTech, as you mentioned, as well with NASDAQ this morning, pharma is, is strong, uh, commercial uh, real estate or com commercial office space might be one of the downsides or threats coming up. But talk sectors a bit, what, what, what should people be looking at? I'll throw that to both of you. Well, I can start. Um, the, the three most active sectors this year so far have been uh, industrials, um, healthcare, uh, and technology. Mm. Uh, it is interesting, though, um, on the industrial sector that they, in some sense, have bucked the trend that I talked about earlier, because in that sector, we've actually seen private equity pretty active. Um, we had um, the uh, Brookfield uh, acquisition of Triton. You had Arconic and Univar getting acquired by Apollo. So it is interesting that it is one area where um, they have leaned in. Um, healthcare is very much was in line with the trend, a lot of big corporate trades, uh, where farmers are sitting on a lot of cash and looking to put it to work, uh, whether it be because patents are expiring or opportunities to um, enhance leadership in particular sectors. Um, and then tech, it's been incredibly challenging for a whole host of reasons. I mean, we know about the inflation, we know about valuation, interest rate rising, but also that's a sector where sponsors have played a pretty big role in overall activity, and that has been quite subdued. Uh, but those are the three areas where we are seeing a lot of activity. I also like look at things in threes, and I think from an AI perspective, there are uh, three categories. There's these industries that are uh, very beneficial from an AI perspective in terms of economics, like the NVIDIAs, the companies that are effectively uh, um, creating uh, an upswing on uh, supply demand imbalances that they have uh, a head start uh, with respect to the AI race. Then there are these industries that um, have a fulcrum effect, whether the AI is going to benefit or amplify their businesses or disrupt their businesses in a negative way. And I think the markets are unclear about which way they go. You know, media has been one of those in terms of music and et cetera. Um, and then three are those industries that feel that they're immune from the AI risk, like uh, you know, creativity and, and uh, ring-fenced communities and so on, which I think is a, is a dangerous place to, to declare themselves as immune. But obviously, there's a hopefulness that um, there are sectors that can uh, be more, you know, humanistic versus obviously uh, oh, subsumed by AI. You, you, you have know. to join my AI panel next. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, exactly. I think there'd be a debate on immunity. But well, but, the, but there are things that I think people are uh, jumping to conclusions on. Obviously, so far, also like the the AI effect on music doesn't have to be all negative. I mean, we've seen some examples where you could say Freddie Mercury. Uh, needs to uh, put a song together the day after a rainy day and you've lost your boyfriend or girlfriend or lover and they can construct a song that will pull your heartstrings right away and it sounds as if it's exactly Freddie Mercury. And these things are interesting and then, then you worry about IP ownership of existing catalogs versus new catalogs and you look at distribution. But I think the distribution models have been so sophisticated over the last few years between Apple and Spotify uh, in music and obviously in video as well, that people have the technology and the data to know what consumers want. So it's not, it's just gonna improve the funnel. Um, and then I think, uh, I think you'll just, consumers will just get the best of uh, everything. Um, and I think IP ownership is less valuable today than kind of front end, like take the cash. Don't, uh, don't demand uh, in terms of the IP ownership. Because I think the front end model for media is something that's gonna be much more important than the back end. Mm. Yeah, interesting. So. How does investor activism play in, in Damine these days? And you could break out the violins, but I'll tell you how challenging a CEO's job is right now. And 
I'm curious what you're hearing from these CEOs. But you know, CEOs now not only have to focus on top line and bottom line growth and double digit, uh, you know, they have to create sustainable business models. They have to be conscientious of uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and they have to create strategic plans that have purpose to bring everyone along with them. Um, so that's the violin part for us CEOs <laughs> in the audience here. But uh, how does that affect M&A? What are CEOs telling you? Well, I mean, I think, look, the activism can be very helpful uh, at the end of the day to be a catalyst for some of these necessary changes. But in a, in I think Salesforce and the activism around Salesforce is a good example of that because it did uh, accelerate some uh, cost reductions and probably tampered some of the M&A activity in favor of organic growth for a while. Uh, but they got to the right place. Sometimes the threat of activism is enough, and that's just good management at the end of the day of doing the right things, uh, because the market pressures will dictate a lot of those things at the end of the day. But I think right now profitability is more important than scale. Liquidity is more important than scale, which is where deal making takes a backseat to just good operations and good coordination and, and renewed focus on management, uh, all the things that you mentioned. Um, getting to your essence, getting to your competitive advantage, focusing on the business. Uh, we'll have another time to get to scale and the ability to get to the, uh, the, uh, the areas of growth. I think you know, regulatory is another form of sort of like uh, activism in a way that you have mm. certain constraints and why tie up assets for a few years if you have uncertainty around the regulatory environment when you can be uh, tending to your existing assets or your employees and your constituents that need to be uh, cultivated, I think first and foremost. Yeah, you have any comments on what CEOs are telling I mean, you these days? Well, the fact is that M&A has been an investment objective of 40% of activist campaigns. And whether it be evaluating the portfolio and looking to see whether all the parts make sense and, uh, or it's an outright sale. And um, so I do think that it does impact the way um, you need to think about your business. What is interesting is that I do think that despite the resurgence in, uh, in overall activism campaigns, companies have gotten a lot smarter in being their own activists and doing that own portfolio assessment, looking at their capital structure, looking at whether they are uh, the right balance of uh, cash, debt, leverage, et cetera. And so whether it's through activism or doing kind of your own self-reflection and analysis, I do think at the end of the day it does position companies to be more resilient and be able to, whether it's the shrinking to grow or it is just uh, diversifying and growing their business or outright sale being part of a broader platform. But it definitely is, I think, one of the catalysts for M&A. Yeah, no, that's great. That, um, you mentioned Messi, and it's interesting how sports ownership has been a very active M&A area. Uh, because partly because of media and real-time viewing and you know all the reasons that we know for the uh, values of those teams going up but that creative uh, financing of how they got messy is really interesting and do you see that happening in an M&A now that very different sort of financing than you've seen in the past yeah I think it goes to what Michal alluded to earlier which is um, the ability to play offense in a defensive landscape mm to get a competitive advantage. And then maybe that is uh, doing M&A, maybe it's where you get your capital or unlocking capital sources. So some of the sports franchises or some of the businesses have gotten capital from the Gulf, which has been a, a major uh, source of capital, sovereign wealth funds, which don't always exist only in the Gulf. Sovereign wealth funds exist in many different areas that are attractive, uh, but they allow you to play offense when the market conditions are more defensive. Um, and a lot of sports franchises have gotten some of that sovereign wealth capital uh, as well to have other forms of financing. Um, that's when private equity has been more diminished. We don't expect the IPO market to be robust until 24, uh, mm -hmm. especially post maybe the election. So you know, you're gonna need other forms of capital, maybe an M&A cycle in certain ways that are some of the smaller M&A deals to account for that. Um, but I also think that alignment of partnerships is a good way to not only create value, but then also attract capital into those partnership models. So once you create those new models, then you can attract new forms of capital, potentially even public capital. Some of these uh, players will own multiple sports clubs, 
not just, uh, not just the Premier League, not just uh, the NBA basketball, but maybe a consortium of clubs that will then attract new forms of capital, public or private. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As we're running out of time here, let me ask one last question on what do you see as the catalyst to M&A and what are the inhibitors right now? Just kind of the yin and yang, quick, quick answers here. I really think it comes down to certainty. We're going to get some better visibility as to where the Fed is at in the with its uh, rate uh, raising. Um, we'll get to see better data around inflation. And so it is all about certainty and visibility so you can make informed decisions. It's incredibly hard to do it when we're not sure whether a transaction will get challenged mm -hmm. by the regulators or whether um, shareholders will not support the transaction or you're not going to be able to get the financing. So to me, it is. Uh, it's, it is about get, getting to a level of certainty where you can uh, make that, have that conviction and willingness to transact. Um, in addition to those factors, I would say liquidity. Uh, liquidity, uh, you know, you, everyone has a great plan, uh, but when you need the capital, you need the capital and valuations come down very fast. Um, and so liquidity is a major catalyst, especially for a generational set of owners of assets that may come to market um, uh, with, uh, with values that are so attractive that people won't be able to ignore them. And then you'll find the buyers come up and be able to get financing. Mm. Well, that's great. Well, thank you very much for sharing your insights into the M&A market. And uh, hopefully next year when we meet here, we're, we'll be able to say, boy, it bucked all the trends and things went up. So thank you very much, uh, REA and Rehal. Thank you for having me.